Hey, you guys, it's Kim. Welcome back to The Control Variable. So I want to start today's show by telling you a story about motherhood, because I've been thinking a lot about motherhood recently, in part because of the crisis we're now dealing with in this country around women's reproduction rights, and in part because motherhood is something I've wrestled a lot with personally, like a serious octopus I've wrestled with in my life. So as we all know, Roe versus Wade, the landmark Supreme Court case that recognized a woman's constitutional right to receive abortions, was overturned in June. The Supreme Court decided we women no longer have the right to decide when and if we should become mothers. We do not know what is best for our bodies. The state government must decide for us. It turns out six in 10 of us disapprove of the court's decision. The vote the other night in Kansas showed us just how much we disapprove. And we disapprove for a lot of reasons. But one of the big ones, one of the really serious ones, is that 25 million unsafe abortions take place around the world every year. And those unsafe abortions are a leading but preventable cause of maternal deaths and morbidities. Unsafe abortions kill women. And unfortunately, making abortion illegal isn't going to keep women from getting abortions. It's just going to make sure that a lot more of them are harmed or die from them. Ever since Roe was overturned, I found myself talking to a lot of other women about their abortions and about my two abortions, sharing our stories back and forth telling what happened, how it happened, why. And as we've been doing this, something amazing happened. First, I realized that I was having some of the best conversations I've ever had. Deep, profound conversations. The kind where you end up hugging each other really hard for a long time afterwards. Crying sometimes, but in a good way. A way that brings you close. Because it turns out our abortion stories are stories about love. Whether it's mother love or self-love. There are stories about sacrifice and health and family and money, stories about spirituality and religion and education and ambition, about trauma, about abuse, about death. And as we've been talking about our abortions, I realized that part of why these stories were so fascinating is that abortion stories aren't really stories we tell here in America. We keep them quiet, secret. And when I was growing up, back in the Stone Ages, we really kept them secret. I mean, if you got pregnant in high school or college, it was bad. Deeply shameful. You were a slut. So like maybe you told your best friend or your sister if you got pregnant. You definitely did not tell your parents. And even now, 30 years later, our abortions still aren't something we really talk about in this country. Up until recently, my abortions are something I've rarely talked about with anyone. And yet they were two of the hardest days of my life. So talking with other women this summer, hearing the stories of their abortions, sharing my own, has been amazing. Like drinking the coldest, clearest mountain water, breathing the freshest air. So I'm going to share the story of my abortions here with you guys today. Because I want to be honest with you about who I am and why women's reproductive rights are so important to me. And because I want to hear more of these stories that we women have carried around inside us for so long. I want to hear as many as possible. So if you feel like it, I'm hoping some of you will share your abortion stories with us on Instagram or on Facebook after the show, because I think these stories are really important. I think they matter. And sharing them, owning them, feels really good. So another thing I've been trying to understand more about is why sharing these stories feels so good. And in trying to understand that, I found myself thinking a lot about this writer I love named Carmen Maria Machado. She's incredible, you guys. If you want to get your face melted off by a book, like in a good way, go read Carmen Maria Machado's memoir, In the Dream House. It will blow your mind. Anyway, in her book, Carmen talks about this idea of the violence of the archive, or quote, archival silence. In a nutshell, what archival silence refers to is all of the stories that have been left out of our history because the men in power either destroyed them or found ways to silence them. So this means we have these huge holes in our history. These big, weird, echoing voids where the stories of people's lives should be. Black people's stories, indigenous people's stories, people of color stories, queer people's stories, poor people's stories, and yes, women's stories. So many women's stories have been left out of our history. Most of them, right? And that, Carmen says, means that when we women go to the archive to find ourselves, to learn about ourselves, who we are, how we're supposed to live this crazy life, There's not much there for us. 
No stories about the healers and midwives and shamans and doctors throughout history who've provided women with the means to induce abortions. No stories about what abortions even mean to women, really. No stories about women whose lives have been saved by abortions or whose marriages have been saved by abortion. And definitely no stories about women like me who wanted very much to be mothers, but didn't end up becoming mothers. And so have found ourselves looking for other ways to be mothers, to share the mothering part of us, that care and nurturing part with the world. Those stories just aren't there. So at a certain point, I realized I wanted to devote an episode of The Control Variable to women's abortion stories. Because a big part of why we make the show is to bring truth, bring stories to light about this country that maybe haven't been included in our history. To add those stories to America's larger story in the hopes of maybe creating a better, truer American story going forward. Which brings me to my very awesome guest on today's show, my old friend Jennifer Baumgartner, who is just such a badass. Jenny's basically devoted her whole career to women, sharing women's stories, advancing women's rights. She's a filmmaker and a journalist and an author and a publisher and a wife and a mom in New York City. She's been the keynote speaker at more than 250 colleges. Also, juicy side note, if you weren't impressed enough already, she's the ex-longtime girlfriend of Indigo Girl Amy Ray. She's been to over 60 Indigo Girls concerts. Girl can dance like nobody's business. So a few years ago, Jenny founded this amazing feminist press called Dautier. I I think I'm saying that right. Anyway, it means daughter in Icelandic. And the press basically works to fill in the absences of our history, those voids I was talking about earlier, and the absences in our current culture. They try and fill them through storytelling in all forms for all ages. It's an incredible company. I highly suggest you look up their books. And last year, because she hadn't done enough already, Jenny also founded this feminist book review called Lieber with the great poet Katha Pollitt. And I highly recommend checking Lieber out because it is awesome. Anyway, Jenny's here with me today because she actually made a really incredible film back in 2004 about women's abortion stories. It's called I Had an Abortion. In it, she interviews women of all ages from all different races and backgrounds about their abortions. Gloria Steinem tells her abortion story. A young Asian American college student tells her abortion story. An 85-year-old black woman tells her abortion story. Every single one of these stories is fascinating, you guys. I wanted them to go on forever. And we're going to share some of those clips from Jenny's film with you guys today while we talk about the movie and share the stories of our own abortions with each other and with you guys for the first time. They say sunlight is the best disinfectant. I think that's true. And I think today's show is about bringing some much-needed sunlight to the topic of abortion. So here's my conversation with Jenny. My name is Shulamit Koenig. I had an abortion in 1950. My name is Sebastiana, and I had an abortion in 2000. My name is Ingrid Tischer, and I had an abortion. I had an abortion in 1973. And I had an abortion in 1960. I had an abortion in 1939. I had an abortion. And I had an abortion. I had an abortion. And I've had three abortions. I had an abortion. And I had an abortion. I had an abortion. I've had two abortions. I had an abortion. I had an abortion. I had one abortion. And I had an abortion. I had two abortions. I had an abortion in 1988. First of all, I just want to say I'm so, thank you so much. I'm so, so excited to be here with you. Oh, my pleasure. So you first came to NYC to model, right? And then... No, did I say that? No, but the Guardian said that. So like the Guardian basically said you like came to NYC to model and took like a hard left, like took a hard left into feminism. No, I think it was that some writer that must have been the writer of that piece asked if I had ever modeled, which I have, but I didn't go anywhere to be. I've never. Okay. So that really wasn't your agenda coming to New York. I had an internship at Ms. Magazine was the real, like the thing that brought me here. And was like initially waitlisted. And then right before Christmas, they called and they were like, one person dropped out and you were next on our list. So, you know, can you get here by Monday? And I was like, yeah. And I I took a train from Fargo. Well, I had a friend named Michael Gardner, kind of a fairy godmother in my life, who I had done plays with and stuff in Fargo. And he had moved to New York. He was into fashion. He was a fashion designer, but also at the at that point, he was a dresser on Broadway. So he lived in New York with his boyfriend. 
And he said, you can come and stay with me for one week on my couch. And if at the end of one week, you haven't figured it out, you'll, you, you won't figure it out, which is so true, which is, I just love that he said that. He was like, anything can happen. You can get a job and an apartment in a week in New York if you're the kind of person that should be in New York. And I was like, okay. But he was right. And within a week, I had an apartment and I was waitressing at this bar restaurant in the village called The Lion's Head, making a lot of cash. By day, I was an unpaid intern at Ms. Magazine. When you met Amy, were you were you working at Ms.? Did you interview Amy for Ms.? Is that how you met her? Amy uh, Ray? I was maybe 27. I had just quit working at Ms., and of course, I knew who Amy Ray and the Indigo Girls were. I'd seen them in concert. Were you already a fan? Oh, God, yeah. I was a huge fan. I'd seen them in concert a bunch in New York. And I'd also just like loved them when I was in college. That's kind of when their first record came out was when I was a freshman or sophomore in college. I think what happened is Amy Ray was and, and Emily were doing a series of concerts. They still work with this organization and do stuff for them. But it was it was an organization they, they founded with Native American activists around the environment. It's called Honor the Earth. And they wanted to get some coverage for their this tour and also for the issues. And so they called Gloria's office and Amy Richards, who was my writing partner and friend, was like, oh, I have the perfect writer for you. Call Jennifer Baumgartner. And so their publicist called me. I was like, okay, we'll fly you out here. We just want to like show you what they're doing da, 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 and see what you can do. And so I met her because they flew me out to... Montana, where they were doing these shows. And Amy Ray and I just clicked immediately with there was a lot of chemistry. <laughs> like, was it like, like backstage or how did? Yeah. Well, they were doing interviews. You know, I got to kind of trail them all day. So I was interviewing them. I was interviewing Winona LaDuke. I was interviewing other activists. Sherman Alexie, the author, was there. It was just like a lot of interesting people. And then later that night, I, yeah, I think I was kind of alone with Amy and it was just clear we had some energy. And then somebody backstage, some, person who didn't work for their team said to me, are you her girlfriend? Because the way we were talking, there just seemed to be some intimacy. And I said, no. But then I was like smart enough to know I should say that to Amy because then it's like letting her know. And so I uh, went up to her and I was like, oh my God, that person just thought I was your girlfriend. (laughs) (laughs) That was so, that was very smart. (laughs) And she said, I don't got a girlfriend. And I was like, okay. You're about to have one, Amy. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. I wanted to talk about how you first got into feminism, like how you first kind of fell in love with women. And I wondered, like, were you like a child feminist? Where did it kind of click with you? Yeah, I think I was. So as as you know, I was raised in Fargo, North Dakota, and it's not a particularly progressive place. I mean, it's the opposite. But it was the early 70s and mid 70s. And early eighties when I was living there and my mother had Ms. Magazine, which is a very mainstream thing, but she, it was, it was still like a real, it was a real kind of throwing down a gauntlet a little bit in that community. She would talk about, there were three daughters in the family and we would talk a lot about feminist things and we used the word. And this was before it was so, it's very mainstream right now, which I embrace, but, and welcome, but I'm conjuring a time when it wasn't. Right. It wasn't like I walked around screaming that I was a feminist, but it was part of my purview. And I thought of it as something that was strong and important. So kind of since forever. Yeah, since forever. And I, and I, I self-styled myself as a tough person, you know, even as a little kid who, who would stand up for others. I had a self-image that I was invested in that, that corresponded to that. I mean, I remember talking about abortion at a really young age and I remember at my school, this is like in grammar school, that we would have a debate about issues. And I don't know why, it must have been right before in a, in a presidential election, but, you know, oh, these are the issues and who's on which side. And they, for some reason, brought up pro-choice or pro-life. And I was the only person who said I was pro-choice. Wow. It kind of continued in that regard. And then when I was in ninth grade, my sister, Andrea, who's a year and a half older than me, got pregnant by this guy, really perfectly nice guy that I do like. She didn't want to tell him. They weren't dating really. And she didn't want to tell my parents, even though we were a pro-life, pro-choice rather family. And we talked about it and identified ourselves that way. And uh, she didn't want mom and dad to know she'd had sex. There was just like a whole bunch of stuff. She felt ashamed of having gotten pregnant. She was a National Merit Scholar at the time. 
you would lose your scholarship. You would? Pregnant. Yeah, that was pretty recently changed. But at the time, that was definitely it because it was, you know, it was a mark of character, a lack of character. So it's like, you know, all this sexist shit is still going on. So she turned to me, you know, she needed to get a judicial bypass because North Dakota was a parental consent or at least parental notification state. And she needed money. She didn't really have any. And you needed around $260 for a first or like a 14 week abortion then. I, you know, and I didn't have the money either, but she, you know, needed another brain on the, <laughs> on the job, I guess. Because in North Dakota, and this is still the case, there was one abortion clinic. They did abortions once a week. The doctor was flown in from another state. And so if you missed that week, you could, would be at a different level of gestation and you might not be able to get the procedure at all in North Dakota. So we had this like time constraint. She needed to do all this in like a week, get the judicial bypass, get the money, get the abortion and not let anyone know other than me and this other friend um, who had had an abortion the year before. And so I like thought about, I, you know, she was desperate. I thought about who I knew who had money and I was in the play Greece at the time. And the guy that was, so I was a freshman and I was Chacha. The guy that was Danny Zuko was a senior and he had mentioned during rehearsals and stuff that he was paying for college the next year. So I figured he'd had to have saved up at least 260 bucks. And so I called him and I was like, I'm in a desperate situation. Would you lend me this money? And he said, yes. And so I like literally, did you tell him what, did you tell him what it was for? And no, you just said you desperately needed I did it? it on the phone. I just said it was desperate. And then when I got there, he had the money and he said, you know, you don't have to tell me, but what was this for? And I could have said anything. I could have said drugs, you know, but I said, oh, it's for an abortion. And he was Catholic. I hadn't like thought that through. I didn't know to think that through yet. And he was like, that's the one thing I can't help you with. And I was so crestfallen and looked so desperate. I mean, my sister was literally at the clinic waiting for me to get this money. And he like, whatever, he took pity on me and he called his friend. He was like, I can't give it to you, but I have a friend who's Presbyterian and he, and I can vouch for you and he'll give it to you. And so that's what he did. And so then I rode my bike to the clinic and handed it off. And Andrew was also on bike, you know, got her procedure and then she didn't want anyone to know. So she rode her bike then to basketball practice and had basketball practice. None of which, the doc, you know, no one <laughs> was recommending her to do that, but she just, you know, was trying to cover it up. And then, you know, a couple months later, or like a year later, mom and dad found out anyway. And they were really shocked and surprised. Not that she got pregnant and had an abortion necessarily, but that she didn't come to them. Yeah, They wanted her to. And so a lot of my adult life thinking about abortion has been thinking about that. And what I've come up with is that I think we were a really loving, quote unquote, pro-choice family, but it was very abstract. Like we didn't know anyone who had had an abortion. We talked about it I think the way most people do, which is like this thing that happens to other people. And therefore, Andrea got this sense of like, it doesn't happen to people like us. You never hear anybody saying I had an abortion. You never hear anybody saying, you know, being open about it. I am not sure that I've ever heard anyone in my family talk about abortion. I didn't tell the friends I was living with in London. Uh, I didn't tell the man in question. I remember thinking, you know, what would people do if they knew? I did not get pregnant as a teenager, but I, I feel like everyone I know who did, which was a, a number of women, were, you know, totally secretive and totally, like, draped in shame. It was awful. I mean, like, let's just be plain. It was the sense that they had done something terrible. And that they were sort of potentially ruined if people knew. I know. I think about that a lot, too. Like, there's this culture of silence that we keep handing down where we could actually share something that would be very helpful, potentially, for our kids. So let's talk about your documentary from 2004, right? I Had an Abortion. I loved it so much. It's so good. The thing is, I I thought it was going to be good. And what I didn't know, but you don't know what shape a documentary is going to take. And I just didn't know that what I would be experiencing is just like women from all walks of life, including Gloria Steinem, and all ages and all races, individually telling their stories of abortion. And 
the stories around how they happened, why they happened. Some women have had had the m- multiple abortions and and the circumstances under which they happened and the impact that the abortions had on their lives. And honestly, like the whole time, I was riveted, and I just I wanted to hear everything. And I realized it's because p- these are stories that people don't tell, like like in that in in, in a forum like that normally. And it's, I mean, it just it seems almost obvious what I'm saying, but it it, it hit me very deeply. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting when you think about some of the, that the story that's so profound, life changing, required bravery, required you know stepping into one's power, all these different things, flouting society, making a decision, and because it's silenced or you don't talk about it, it also is just this like this is like having a cork in a bottle. There's all this pressure on it too. So I, I think that's a really interesting element of like women's empowerment or lack thereof, all these things that are profound that we're encouraged to lie about. And then you spend so much time keeping the the cork in your bottle when the power of like being your whole self can't come out. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like emotional, you know, anorexia. Totally. No, that's a very good way of saying it. I mean, when I think about it, all I ever want to hear from people are like their deepest stories, like they're the stories of what has moved them most in life. Right. Like that's just always what I kind of want to get to. And in that sense, like that's just what you're doing in that documentary is you just found all these ma- wonderful, wonderfully articulate women from all walks of life. These stories, they're weirdly about life and death and about like one's future, one's spirituality, one's family. I mean, it's crazy how much it incorporates, you know? So how did you decide to make that? Well, the start of it was that my uh, niche, my beat basically as a magazine writer had been you know, these sort of really banner feminist topics, sexual assault, abortion. I wrote about that stuff a lot. And I kind of got to the point where I was feeling a little bored with the way that these stories played out because it was always a lot of rhetoric and not a lot of story, honestly, because people tended not to want to put their honest experiences in there. And so a really you know, super loud, super strong advocate for abortion, maybe who's like the head of some national organization or is a lawyer or, or a congressperson or something, they wouldn't say, and also I've had an abortion and here's my story. Here's what's happened to me. And I started to really feel the absence of the story. Like I knew that there were 1.3 at the time, it's much lower now, but at the time for like 30 years, it had been 1.3 million abortions a year in the US alone. So that's a lot of people. And so I started to feel tired of the opinions and interested in this and, and hungry for the story. The first thing I did is I, I think is that I made this um, t-shirt that said I had an abortion. I might be going out of order, but it was just sort of like I had this idea in my head kind of forming of like, what if there was a project? And the whole point of the project was you didn't need to have had a positive experience. You don't even need to be pro-choice, but you, if you've had an abortion, you say it and you, and you tell your story with your name and hopefully without politics. And just tell your story and what happened to you before and what happened to you after. So I, I, I wrote a story. I wrote for The Nation a lot back then. I wrote a story for The Nation kind of tying into this website that had just launched. I mean, it was very low def called I'm not sorry.com where this woman, Patricia Beninato, who's probably 10 years older than me, was just had people just like, write, I had an abortion. I'm not sorry or whatever. Not with their name, anonymous. And I was thinking like, that's kind of cool. And I would like to improve upon that. And so I wrote this article about Ben and Otto, you know, quoting her and then saying, you know, I'm really interested in people's stories, like soup to nuts. If you have a story, write to me. And I was overwhelmed with stories, like handwritten letters, all sorts of stuff. And from wide range of people, wide range of ages, it was really moving. But then once it started like forming more into an actual project or something that had shape, a lot of people that I knew wanted to be interviewed. So like Gloria Steinem, Billy Avery, who's a really, really important um, second wave women's health figure. And so I got the chance with my friend, Jillian Aldrich to interview. I think we interviewed 25 or 30 people on film in these four or three hour interviews. It was very well received. It was interesting. People were really, really hungry for the stories. And then there's this whole big world of feminists who, where this kind of thing was, was the number one issue. And they were really excited to have another thing to rally around that gave some 
you know, energy to it or, you know, voice to it. And then Women Make Movies, which is a second wave founded women owned film distribution company. They distributed it right away, kind of no questions asked, which was really nice. And also, you know, were willing to totally strike a deal with me where I could still do my own thing, distributing it or doing it because I was touring a lot with it. And they just kind of handled academic sales. And they did that with my second documentary too, which was about rape. So it sold to thousands of schools, you know, like colleges. And so it ended up having a real life that I think, you know, was important. It didn't have a theatrical life, but I don't know that it's the kind of thing that would draw a theatrical crowd. It's more of a something you watch in college or you watch on your own. Why do you think people have such intense, vehement reactions about abortion, around abortion? I don't want to make this sound too theoretical, but this is really true. I mean, if you control women's bodies, then you control the population. You know, you can keep the races separate. You control women's ability to to be equal, you know? I think I think it really is how threatening to acknowledge that women, people with the ability to get pregnant, have the ability to give life and ipso facto the ability to not give life. And other people do not have that. I think it's just too threatening. It's too threatening for a lot of women to face. And we're we're eating, and I said, Mother, there's something I really have to tell you. And she said, Well, what is that, dear? And I said, I said, Mother, I've had an abortion. And my mother just was eating her yogurt, and she said, well, dear, I've had two. Now let's go look at the paintings. And it was just, it was just such a relief that I could tell her and that she could one-up me, although she didn't know what she really equaled my experience. But it was enough, to, especially because my mother really was such a puritanical person. Um, and I became closer and closer to my mother after that. I realized there was nothing I couldn't tell my mother. So let's let's tell our abortion stories. Okay. Yeah, you go first. So my experience, you know, I don't know if technically it's called an abortion, but it I mean, basically my experience was this. When I was 39 and I was in a serious relationship and we were talking about getting pregnant and, and we were trying and I to my great delight got pregnant and I think I got to like my 11th week and started bleeding and I was home alone because he was at work for the day. So I called the doctor and it was awkward because I had never seen that. Like I had, I don't know, we'd like changed healthcare or something. And so I'd never seen that, that gynecologist before. And so I called her office and I was like, I'm bleeding quite a lot and it's starting to hurt. And they were like, "Mm, see what happens, like wait an hour or two and then call us. So I waited. And by the time I called back, I was like bleeding profusely and in like, you know, astonishing pain, like I could barely talk. Right. And they said, okay, well, it sounds like you're miscarrying. And why don't you come into the office? And I lived in Brooklyn at the time. And so I got a cab. And I mean, I remember sitting in the cab, just like screaming. Like I, I, I've I've never experienced pain like that in my life. Like I just could not believe how painful it was. And then by the time I got, I mean, I could barely walk to the office. Right. And I remember sitting in the office and like the nurse basically telling me to be quiet because I just, but I, I just, right. Like it was that bad. She was like, you're scaring people. And I, I, you know, I, did she try to comfort you or was she just like, not really. I mean, they weren't, she wasn't great about it, to be honest. You know, it's probably hard if you work in a place to have people screaming there. Like I, I was trying very hard not to be in as much pain as I was in, but it was, it, I'm just, pointing it out to try and convey just how unbelievably painful it was. So by the time I got into the doctor's, into the examining room, she was like, okay, you're definitely miscarrying. And she was like, and if, and I was like, is there anything you you can do? And she was like, yes, I can do a partial DNC, which will basically just speed up the miscarriage. Like there's no life in the fetus. And so basically I will be, I will be taking it out. And I was like, okay, again, like just breathtaking pain. And all I can say is, is that it, that went on. It took a while. And if I had not been able to have that, like that was an expedited experience, right? If I had not been able to have assistance with it and I had had, had, to, had to go through that at home with my partner or with anywhere else without a doctor around, like just, I can't fathom it, right? Like I just, I just, the idea that you would not be able to assist somebody and that there are these women 
literally since Roe was overturned, who have in Texas and in Wyoming, who have gone, who have found that they were miscarrying, have gone to the hospital for help and who were not given help because the doctors were afraid of retribution. They were afraid that what that helping them would be illegal. That just and so that was really, really awful. And I remember calling my sister and I was like, I just had a miscarriage. And, and she was like, are you okay? And I, you know, it's like the, co- the the culture is so like non-conversant about it that I was like, I'm fine. I'll just go home. She was like, no. And thank God she came because it, you know, it, it would have been really hard again. But again, I just want to point out the like the weirdness of the fact that like, I didn't even know how to handle what I was dealing with. I just didn't know how to have any of the conversation really, or how to, what any of the emotional piece of it would be. So that was, it was totally devastating. And then a few years later, after I was married and we had been going through IVF for a couple of months and really, again, really, really wanted to have a baby and I got pregnant and we're so excited again, you know, just like so excited. And we knew it was a girl and I went to have the heartbeat. I went to have the, it was a 10 weeks and I went to the, my gynecologist to have the first ultrasound and it was supposed to be where you would hear the heartbeat for the first time. And I remember my doctor's face just draining the blood draining from his face, just his face turning white. And he was like, hold on a minute. And I knew something was wrong. And he took me into this other room where there were like, where there was like a more powerful ultrasound, like a more sensitive ultrasound. And eventually, you know, he said, you're not, you know, this isn't, there isn't a heartbeat. This isn't going to be this, there isn't a life here. It's not going to be a viable pregnancy. And I was like, are you sure? And he said, yes, but come back in a week and, and let's see. And so I came back in a week and at that point, he confirmed it. And he said, so, and I said, well, what happens now? And he said, well, if if we don't do anything, you'll just naturally miscarry. You'll just basically go through what I had gone through two years earlier, again, at any time, with or without any kind of people to help you around, right? I mean, this is just what I find absolutely terrifying, right? And he was like, so I'd much rather give you the DNC in my office so that we can make sure that you're properly cared for. And- save you from an endangering and horrific traumatic experience. And it's still going to be painful and it's still going to be really desperately sad, but at least you can be cared for in this situation and you can make sure that you, your safety can at least be preserved. And so then I had, I had, I, I scheduled a DNC or an abortion. Yeah. So, so for me, it's, you know, like I tell myself it's not as wrenching because it was relatively early in the first, you know, like I was in the first trimester and et cetera, but it was, you know, devastatingly disappointing and also just like really, really an awful thing for anyone to experience without any, and trying to imagine it without assistance is just unthinkable, honestly. Did they either time dilate you in order to do the DNC? I can't remember. Like, I remember that the second DNC was much less of a big deal, like much less, right? Like, right, because it was scheduled and I wasn't in that actively miscarrying, right? It was just like there was a dead fetus inside of my body, right? And so they probably did dilate me. And I I don't have any pain trauma around that, around the second one. So whatever they did was a much, much better handled experience. But I think when somebody starts to miscarry, you can't, once it's started, I'd, I think that there, you're just going to go through a lot of pain, even if it's expedited, right? Like it's just going to be either a fair amount of pain or an enormous amount of pain, right? I mean, the other thing, to be honest with you, the other thing about this is like, I remember afterwards thinking being devastated by it would be trying to fight a battle that I couldn't win and that I didn't want to be devastated by it because there was nothing, it was totally out of my control. Like my body had, had rejected it and I was sad. Yeah, a lot of women have that experience and a lot of women have miscarriage experiences, which I think this is changing a little bit, but which I think is also gets very suppressed in society, like either minimized like, oh, well, you know, some sort of uh, arbitrary, it wasn't far enough along for you to feel bad or whatever, you know, people get told how to feel about these things. It's obnoxious. I mean, I I understand why we do it. I think it's because we all have our own fears about, you know, things that can go wrong with, you know, our own pregnancies or things that we want. But yeah. I mean, I would say that my, I've, I've had two kids and then after the second child, I had one abortion and it was a medication abortion, meaning I took Mifeprex. I took one pill in the doctor's office to kill the, the heart, you know, stop the heart. And then a bunch of pills the next day, it buckly, which means in your cheek, melting in your cheek. Yeah. So I had two kids, but the younger kid was maybe was still a baby. 
And it was, a you know, it was a accidental pregnancy, you know, with, with the two other pregnancies, they had been sort of accidental in their own way, like pretty spontaneous and, you know, not something I'd been trying to do, but I felt so psyched when I found out I was pregnant. And this was the first time I just didn't feel that I felt kind of, I didn't feel horrified or terrified, but I felt kind of like, Oh, wow. I can still remember all that nausea. Now I guess I have to sign up for that again, you know? Yeah. So I just didn't feel excited. And I felt like, God, I have a baby who needs attention. I have my own life that needs attention. And this is definitely going to cut in on that. You know, it's, it, it, these things again are just, they're very personal, like your conversation in your head. And so after like a day or so, I was sort of like, I kind of know I don't want to do it. And if my husband really, really wants it, uh, that might have an, imp- might get an impression on me, but barring that. And, you know, maybe given that I was already saying I didn't really want to, <laughs> Michael didn't say that. He didn't say that. And I don't know, you know, I don't know what the factors were there, but necessarily we've talked about it a little bit since, but I think it, when it's not in your body, you don't remember it as well. He's sort of like, I don't really remember what I said, you know, but I know what I heard or wanted to hear. And so I did it and it was drama free. It was totally drama free. So what you're describing, I did not experience. Thank God. It was easy to do because it's New York city. And I went to my doctor's office. Was it pain free? No, it wasn't pain free because it's that whole thing that they give you, you know, you're basically miscarrying, you're inducing a miscarriage. So I had to have like a 12 to 24 hour thing of the, of the, contractions and the, and the expelling the contents of of my uterus, it was manageable. You know, it was totally manageable. I did it at home. And, um, I'm, that's more than 50% of, of abortions are medication abortions now anyway. And so it's, that's the, that's the experience. And sometimes people have really like a tremendous amount of pain and it's kind of unbearable. And maybe they would have been better off having a five minute DNC procedure or a section carotage procedure. And other people really, it's, you know, it's kind of a blip like it was for me. And so, yeah, and I never, I always talked about it. I've always talked about it with the kids. I mean, I do think that the fact that my sister, who's my older sister, had this abortion experience when I was so young and she was so young. And so I got to have like a trial run when it wasn't me. I was able to have conversations about it where I wasn't worried that people thought, you know, whatever story we tell ourselves about, if, if you're a teenager and you get pregnant or whatever, and you need an abortion or choose to have one. I wasn't telling my, that story about myself in my head. I didn't have that like worst case scenario. So I think that might've protected me a little bit. So I got to like work through a lot of my feelings and I was adjacent. I was, I was let in, but it wasn't really about me and my, my fears because I do know the first time I was kind of sharing with my, not so much my, yeah, my parents, my parents about my first girlfriend. And so kind of coming from them assuming I'm, and me assuming I'm heterosexual to having to like, basically worry about, because we also always were like, we're all pro-gay rights, but then there's a difference between saying it and then all of the homophobia that you've internalized, (laughs) you know, and I was really, really scared and it felt very different when it was me, when I was the one. I mean, I still did it, but it, 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 there were different stakes. And by the time I had an abortion, it was very easy to tell my mom, I had already made this film, you know, like it was just, I, I processed a lot by then. Okay, so let's shift a little bit for a minute here. And I just want to talk about in terms of, you know, since Roe has been overturned, I I mean, I want to hear how you're dealing, honestly. Okay, the truth is I'm pretty numb and compartmentalized. I saw it coming a long time ago. I felt for a long time, like, the conversation and the laws and the tides (laughs) we're not breaking in our favor, favor of this right. And even really started to doubt that I'm not blaming women at all, at all, but even like how we've been so conditioned to not expect anything that we were sort of like, well, do we really deserve to have that power over our bodies? Will we really make good decisions? You know, like there was almost like a, I don't want to say, it's not like Hitler's willing executioners, but there was a way in which, I'm just thinking of cliches for some reason, but lamb to the slaughter, that sort of thing was sort of like already in my mind. And I was working really hard not to like forecasting and then sort of like, Oh God, Jennifer, why are you putting that out into the world? That's really wrong. You know, that's not fight, you know? But so I guess when it happened, I was very, I was visiting my best friend from childhood, visiting school uh, colleges with my older child in Minneapolis. And her husband like woke me up and he was like, Roe was just overturned. 
And I was like, well, I knew that was going to, I had this really just like, wah, once for breakfast sort of response. And it's not because I'm cold to it at all. I feel numb and I don't think that that's even very useful, but I, that's just what's going on right now. So I'm kind of like, wah, you know. I got involved with a local church where I was babysitting their children on Sundays while they went to church. And I remember thinking, yeah, everybody thinks that I'm so great, but if they knew, you know, they wouldn't want me to babysit their children. After that, I didn't talk about it for probably five or six years. I think that by not talking about my experience for so long, I think that the seed, it started out as just, you know, this seed of shame that just, you know, my silence just provided this more and more fertile soil and it just continued to thrive. And, and I think that when you talk about these issues, then it just, it casts the shame out. One thing I wanted to ask you about, because I, I found myself thinking about this a lot, sort of since the pandemic started, what I just found myself like realizing was that there was sort of this narrative that things are really great for women now. Like even in the first few years of the Trump presidency, I feel like I when I would talk to people about, I would talk to friends, I would talk to colleagues. I think it was particularly around the Me Too movement. And it would be sort of like, it wasn't a resistance to the truth of the stories. It was more of women's stories. It was more like, but women have have it so good now. Women are equal, basically, right? Like women are making money and have jobs. And I, I just got that a lot. And I just, the more I thought about it, I thought, okay, women a, a hundred years ago, before a hundred years ago, were not allowed to be educated. We're not allowed to have to own property. We're not allowed to vote. We're not allowed to like, like, you know, their husbands were allowed to beat them, right? And so there's a level on which I guess I just feel like wildly aware of the fact that like women we're just, fig- I think we're just figuring out who we actually are. And I think that we're dealing with a lot of backlash to that in a strange way. Yeah. Well, and you know, it's funny, the whole me too thing. I mean, that was such a skin deep, very shallow quote unquote revolution. And it was hundred percent based on women publicly acknowledging, acknowledging being sexually victimized, which is like, a, you know, a real, real thing. And it's certainly of epidemic proportions, but it's a, not the only thing we want to talk. It's not the only part of women's lives. You know, it's not, it's not the whole of women's lives. And I felt like we made some progress in that you didn't have to be a perfect victim finally, but you did have to be a perfect predator. So like the people that ended up going down were so, who saw jail time were just such like cartoon level, like the pull pot of, you know, date rape kind of things. So, and also it was coming, it was sort of like, we had already demonstrated that we hated women because we, couldn't, but we would rather vote for Donald Trump than Hillary Clinton, this really competent person, because there were so many things about her we didn't like. So it's like, to me, the Me Too movement in the face of that was like such cold comfort. There's just this level where I feel like actually women have kind of been culturally gaslit in this country. Oh, for sure. For sure. Right. It's like there's this collective narrative that we've all been told and taught as truth about who we are. And I mean, specifically in my lifetime and in our lifetime, right. Which is kind of like women have a great, like you've come a long way, baby. And like, there's been this story that like, I mean, it, it's, it's now undeniable that we can't pretend that like the rights aren't being taken away. Right. But there's been this sense. And I guess this to me speaks to the level of passivity and, and willingness to go along with the agenda of the, the church, with the pro-life agenda, which is just like women not even recognizing the extent to which we deserve autonomy over our bodies, right? Like, I, I'm just basically coming back to what you said. Yeah, well, deserve, need, need <laughs> needed in order to be in the world. So that's my friend, Jenny. Those are our abortion stories. I don't know if I've ever let myself be honest about how sad I was about mine and how grateful I am that I was able to have both of them. In general, I tend to be kind of a soldier about these things. I keep a stiff upper lip. I'll tell myself I'm privileged. My story is nothing compared to what other women have suffered. And that's true. But it's also true that I could have died if I hadn't had medical assistance while I was miscarrying. 
Delays in expelling tissue from a pregnancy that's no longer viable can lead to hemorrhaging, infections, and sometimes life-threatening sepsis. It happens all the time. And it's true that my abortions have had a big impact on my life. I'm someone who wanted to be a mom, right? Someone who wasn't able to be a mother in a traditional way. But because I was given appropriate medical care during my miscarriages, I've had the opportunity to think about what another kind of mothering might look like. How I might use the mom part of me, the care and attention that I would have given to a child in a different way. How I might share it. I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be doing this podcast right now if I'd had kids. Not because traditional moms don't have podcasts, we know they do, but because it would have been a very different kind of podcast, a more traditional podcast. I know myself. If I'd had children of my own, I'd be a lot more like my friends, freaking out about money, worrying about how to save up enough for my kid's college, and whatever crazy kid thing they're obsessed with at the moment, the cool jeans, cool sneakers, the sick headphones. Instead, I'm here with you, trying to think and talk, honestly, about this crazy, amazing life of ours. Wondering how our beautiful country got so screwed up. Wondering how we might start to make a better one. Because that's the kind of mothering I think I'd like to be part of. The kind I hope to be part of in a small way. All right, that's our show for today. And to find out more about Daughter Press, go to daughterpress.com, D-O-T-T-I-R-P-R-E-S-S.com. And to find out more about Lieber, go to libreview.com, L-I-B-E-R-R-E-V-I-E-W.com. To donate in support of women's continued abortion access, go to weareplannedparenthood.org, W-E-A-R-E-P-L-A-N-N-E-D-P-A-R-E-N-T-H-O-O-D.org. I'm Kim Cutter. Thanks so much for joining me on The Control Variable. See you next time. Guys, if you like the show, please be sure to go rate, review, and follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. It really helps. And be honest, okay? Tell us what you liked. Tell us what you didn't like. What annoyed the hell out of you? What you want to hear more of? I'll listen. I promise. We're in this together, okay? Let's make something amazing. The Control Variable is brought to you by Atomic Whale Studios and executive produced by Jonathan Wilson. The podcast was created by Jonathan, Brian Blatstein, and me. Brian Blatstein is the supervising producer. Rob Okendo and I are producers of the podcast. The technical producer and supervising editor is Derek Michaud of Shelby Row Productions. Sound editing is by Alex Aerosmith, and technical support is provided by Eric Totora Patu. Website creative direction by Randy Braceoff. Original music was composed and performed by Dan White. The control variable is managed by Sean Madison. Fact checking by Kelly Stakopoulos. Megan Petta is our researcher, guest coordinator, and the person who keeps the control variable train on the tracks every day. Finally, I'm your writer and host, Kim Cutter. A very special thanks to everyone who made our show possible.